Hello and welcome to those of you who have already joined the T Think Equal family and to those who have not yet I say please please do consider joining us in what we believe is the most critical and urgent work to be done in our country and indeed in our world. First let me say that this is always my favourite part having the honour to be addressing some of our most important support workers in the country. You who nurture and support our most vulnerable citizens, our children, to have positive life outcomes. There surely is nothing more important than that. And, and I cannot be more respectful or more thankful for all of the work that you're doing every day you are at the very cold face of change for a better world. Thank you for that. I want to start off by introducing Think Equal and just telling you a little bit about its origins and insights. How did I come to found this movement and program? Well, in a most unusual way. Um, in prison cells in India, I went there, uh, and here I must um, give a, a trigger warning. There are some distressing facts um, that I cannot avoid mentioning that were absolutely critical and seminal to my understanding of how we solve the ubiquitous and intransigent problem of gender-based violence. This is how this whole movement and program began, although gender equality is actually just one of our 25 competencies and skills that we mediate to our children. But I went to India to document a very brutal gang rape case. You may well remember it. It stopped the heartbeat of the world. It was the young girl on the moving bus in Delhi who had been so brutalised that I found myself in contemplating what kind of film I was going to be making, because in those days I was a filmmaker, I omitted to say. Um, I found myself thinking that the only purpose of making a film about this case was not to campaign and create yet more awareness. We have, heaven knows, enough awareness about gender-based violence, but that the purpose would be to find out what kind of human beings do to another human being what these six men did to this young girl who died 13 days after this brutal attack. And I managed to get access to these men and to sit and look into their eyes. And I can tell you, the biggest shock I got was, one, they were not monsters. They were not the psychopaths I anticipated. They were perfectly normal, sad to say, ordinary human beings. They felt no remorse, no regret. And I, who had been raped at 18 and thought that the anger I would feel in those prison cells would compel me to assault one of them, I felt no anger at all. It just didn't surface. Why? Because it was so absolutely clear that these men had been programmed. They had been taught to think as they think. And who had programmed them? Well, we had. In other words, culture, socio-cultural thinking. And I think this is clearly the case in every single country around the world. It expresses itself differently in each country. But it is absolutely true that from the moment our children open their eyes in the world, we teach them generationally, cyclically, our primary belief systems. And those belief systems are very often choked by discrimination and by notions of comparative value of human beings. 
this human being of this religion or of this colour or of this gender is actually worth more or entitled to more or these regulations apply to that gender. And so it was with that girl who was raped and murdered by these men. They actually believed that she deserved what she got because she was out at night after dark. They believed and told me that she was a slut and that they had a duty to teach her a lesson. You can hear I could go on about this for a long time and I certainly don't intend to because we have much more important business here and that is to address how do we solve this? We know the problems. We as a world have been reactive to these problems and continue to be, but where are the prevention programmes? That is what I realised in those prison cells in India. And I remembered Nelson Mandela having said that education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. But I found myself really confused by this assertion because, yes, the men I had interviewed had almost in exclusively had no um, a secondary education, only one of them had, all the rest left at 11, 12, 13. But then I found myself interviewing their entire legal teams and they had had the highest possible access to education and yet they were worse than the rapists in the sort of things they uttered. One of the lawyers said, if that girl on the bus had been my daughter, I would take her home to my family in my farmhouse and I would pour petrol over her and burn her alive. And he meant it. So what kind of education was Mandela talking about when he said it's the prime engine of progress, the most powerful weapon we have to change the world? Well, he certainly was not talking about that kind of education. But that is the kind of education that we are meeting out to our children. Numeracy, literacy, testing, teaching them in batches. It's the industrial revolution model and it's not fit for purpose. So we at Think Equal are determined to bring what we call the missing subject to the education system. We want a system change. Um, I discovered what Mandela meant by education, by the way, um, because I, I knew that a mind as brilliant as he had would not have left that word undefined when he used it in such a dramatic way in that quote. Um, and then I found another, even more famous quote, perhaps, which clearly explained to me what he meant by education and the moment at which the light bulb went off and I realised what is needed uh, and pledged the rest of my life to achieving this. Um, what he meant by education is this. He said, no child is born hating another human being because of the colour of their skin, their religion, or any other background, a child has to be taught to hate. And if he can be taught to hate, he can be taught to love. And I knew that I had been sitting with men for 31 hours of interviews along those um, several weeks in those prison cells. I'd been sitting with men who had been taught to hate. And if you teach people how to think, you teach them how to act. So in essence, this is what we are asking you to do through the Think Equal program, is to teach our children to love, to love themselves, to love one another. And if we do that, they will thrive and they will care and, and have well-being and positive pro-social outcomes for the rest of their lives if we do this in the early years, foundationally. And they, they will have all of that for life if you but 
follow this programme and its lesson plans with fidelity and with integrity. So our mission at Think Equal is to bring the missing third dimension, which we call social and emotional learning for well-being and for social justice, front and centre alongside numeracy and literacy as one of the core purposes of early years education. Now, why early years? Well, because we have a unique opportunity in the early years for brain development. So, as I said, what we need is prevention programmes and interventions, especially at those crucial ages when our children are developing their feelings, their thoughts, their values, their primary belief systems, their character and their moral compass. And most especially during those early years from three to six when the brain is actually being built, we know that 90% of the adult brain is fully developed by the age of five. I think equal, um, we, we ask a very important framing question of our education ministers and policy makers whom we meet with around the world and try to persuade to adopt this program compulsorily actually, because we ask them this. If you take seriously your duty of care to our youngest, our most vulnerable citizens, our children, well, how on earth can we consider it to be compulsory for them to learn numeracy and learn literacy, but it's optional for them to learn the value of another human being or to have healthy relationships. This can't be optional. <laughs> we have to prepare our children, not just to be these cogs on a conveyor belt to the labour market, focusing on what and how they will earn, but we also have to prepare them to live a life with dignity, a life that respects the dignity of all others. A life in which they have the tools to take care of themselves. So we believe that education, especially in the early years, must provide our children with a foundation in empathy, in respect for others, critical thinking, conflict resolution, self-regulation, emotional literacy, inclusion, compassion, gender and racial equality, environmental care, empathy, the glue that holds all of that together. In short, social and emotional learning for well-being and for social justice. The necessary foundation for human rights, for peace and prosperity. And with expert help, we have designed just such a programme. I was no expert, of course. I was a filmmaker. So I brought the experts together and, thank heavens, managed to persuade them to come from their extraordinarily preeminent silos um, and come together in a committee of 22 thought leaders from around the world to design and support us in building this program and they were all experts, thought leaders in the realms of gender, uh, human rights, neuroscience, psychology and of course education. So these experts have helped us build and design and deliver this global resource to educate the hearts of the world's children, not just their heads. And now together we can co-create pro-social neuro pathways in the developing brains of our children and ensure that they last for the rest of that child's life. And all of this is based on evidence and based in science. 
Later on in this presentation, you will see the details of the 60 plus years worth of evidence that has built up longitudinal evidence from incredibly preeminent scientists proving what I have just said, and indeed the Think Equal program, and indeed the best practice programs within it, having themselves been tested and proved to be incredibly powerfully impactful across many very diverse countries. So we mediate all of this through the powerful medium of narrative, story, character. Uh, one thing I know as, a, as an ex-filmmaker um, is that narrative is the most powerful conduit for empathy. We meet the child where the child is at, be that child neurotypical or child with special needs. Actually, we believe every single child has special needs. Um, whether it's a child who's traumatized, a child who is dysfunctional, um, we meet and embrace and celebrate that child for who they are uniquely. And through the medium of our narrative picture books, our hopeful new narratives, we nurture loving, engaged, pro-social, responsible, responsive, mentally healthy children. And through also our 25 competencies and skills, we create a new collective narrative in that classroom or in that setting for our future communities, our societies and our countries. I have to stress that Think Equal is also a mental health response tool at a foundational critical um, level and is a post-COVID response. We're only just beginning now to realize with enormous shock the degree of the disruption that has taken place to the stages of early childhood development in our children and to their socialization, etc. This is why the NHS Mental Health and Education team is co funding alongside the mayoral office, the combined authority of Greater Manchester, and indeed the violence reduction unit of the police, the rollout to reception and nursery classrooms across all of Greater Manchester. We are so excited um, and proud uh, and expectant and optimistic about that. When we started planning the model for implementation, we realized that an already overstretched, highly pressured, overburdened workforce is going to be the one that is entirely responsible for mediating this critical learning across all countries. And we responded to this profound understanding through providing you, the teachers, the practitioners, with what we hope and has certainly been designed as is a plug and play toolbox. In one four and a half kilogram box, you will find the 24 narrative picture books one a week expressing the two or three themes of that week, the 90 lesson plan booklet with three lesson plans each week, unpacking the learning based on the books, and a booklet of 50 plus easy to implement um, accompanying resources. We have mapped it for you against the early years framework to show you how through this comprehensive, holistic program, you meet, actually not only meet, but exceed the goals set and expected by Ofsted. This is not by any means 
something extra that we're putting on your plate, but actually it is the very set of tools through which the EYFS framework can be brought to life and its goals realized tangibly, concretely in your classroom. So in fact, and this has been the experience of the teachers around the world who are using the program in several thousands of classrooms in 26 countries, that actually it frees up time for them, it unburdens them because the work cross-referencing and mapping has already been done by us. We give that to you um, and then you have everything you require in this wonderful box. Um, the training, the training you'll hear much more about in the presentation, but I just want to point out that it is minimal purposefully for the same reason we know how little time you have we know how how much you are taken for granted and how overburdened you are so we want to be respectful of your time and input and we've designed this in fact so that you train while you teach we have laid out the lessons in that particular way there is an advanced training, but a fairly brief one, 15, 20 minute modules, which are totally self-paced and self-directed. You can do at your own convenience and in your own time. And we've tried to make them engaging with the experts themselves um, being filmed through them. Um, in, in conclusion of my introduction, um, because you, you have a lot of wonderful details coming up. Um, I just want to say that in, in the midst of the, the emergencies that are unfolding worldwide today, almost everywhere we look, what we need are concrete programs which build a better world, which prevent violence and discrimination and selfishness and greed. We now urgently need to build a decent, caring, responsible, loving, inclusive, just and safe world. And we all long for this. And of course, this programme is also desperately needed in our schools now more than ever as we face the after effects of COVID-19 with the disruption, as I mentioned earlier, of our children's our youngest children's very development. And when our children are actually showing very distressing signs associated with mental health disorders. So it's you who hold our collective future in your hands. And I implore each and every single one of you here present to give your heart, please give your heart to this sacred work with our children. And in doing so, we will create a safe place and a dignified and an equitable world together. We are by your side and at your service always to ensure the success of this programme for our children. Thank you.